for it, find it, make it your own. It's the Get Thrifty Podcast. Welcome to the show. You have discovered the Get Thrifty Podcast brought to you by ARC Thrift Stores right here in colorful Colorado. ARC Thrift Stores is a nonprofit thrift store chain. And if you're in Colorado or visiting us, please check out one of our 34 Front Range and Western Slope locations. You will not be disappointed. I am your host, Maggie Civic, and we are all about sharing everything that has to do with shopping secondhand. So if you're part of our unique thrift culture, please contact us. We would love to promote your businesses and your social channels and share your stories and advice with with our listeners. You can find us on Instagram at ArcThrift. Send us a DM and let's chat. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very excited. I've been thinking about this guest all week long. Very excited to welcome William to the show. William is a director, editor, film lover, photographer, traveler, and antique hunter. You can find Will and his family at Picker Road on YouTube. This really is a family affair for William and his family. We're going to ask all the details. Welcome, William, to the Get Thrifty podcast. This is officially the shortest bio I have ever had on the pod. So kudos to you, sir. Short and sweet. (laughs) We like it. Well, thank you so much for having me. We're really excited. Um, Let's start with your social handles because I find that people like to kind of follow along and, uh, you know, peruse the interwebs as they listen to the show. How can we find you? Absolutely. We are on YouTube at Picker Road. We are on Whatnot at Picker Road. And we will be launching our Instagram channel in 2024. So it will have the same handle or something very close to. I love it. Keeping it simple. It's so much easier with when you're consistent. So I, I do want to give a little backstory. We met at the Boss Reseller Remix. Instantly, I was like, this is so fun what William is up to and the fun things that he and his family are doing um, are just absolutely delightful. Um, I loved your enthusiasm. After my presentation, we instantly connected again. It was like so great having you and your family in the front row to like make me feel less nervous. So thank you for that. Oh, it was, my, it was our pleasure. And you instantly sold us when you said Dolly. <laughs> I love that we have that in common. So we'll definitely dive into that deeper. But before that, let's kind of back up. How did you find this whole world? We want to hear your story. I- I'm absolutely obsessed with your video content, but how'd you get here? Well, it's really generational for us. Um All the way back to my grandparents on both sides, Um, they loved uh, antique hunting and traveling. My uh, my mother's parents on the East Coast would uh, go from New York to Connecticut and they would uh, go antique hunting. Um, I have antiques in my home right now that that they found in the 1950s and 60s. Um, And that, you know, translated down into my parents who then instilled that in me. So uh, I grew up going to garage sales and thrifting and searching for treasures. And uh, as we developed into uh, doing television production, it became a really great release. Um, I love what I do. I absolutely love what I do. But every now and then you need to just take a step back and do something else and find your, your passion. And this was something that was a great passion for all of us to go out and look for that hidden treasure or learn a new story because I love history. Mm -hmm. And if you can pick up an item and you can learn the history behind it, it kind of enriches your understanding of history. Mm, I love that because it really does, um, you know, keep things alive and out of landfills and keeping Mm -hmm. that history alive is a super special piece of what all of you do in this, in this world. So let's go back. Your video production is really, you know, where you guys started in all of this. Talk about that because I wouldn't be giving an homage to our girl Lisa who is obsessed with all the things you do with animals so talk about your video career as well so we have produced over 15 lifestyle reality shows in the Southern California area Um, currently we're doing a production uh, called Animal Zone which is about animal welfare and rescue and uh, that show has been running for about seven years now I would say and um, it's had a wonderful rise. It went from being a regional production to being nationally syndicated to about a year and a half ago going international uh, on Tubi and several other streaming platforms. So uh, by way of that show, we were able to go across America. And uh, and then earlier this year, we went international. We filmed in Switzerland, and that allowed us the opportunity to then go to uh, Paris and do the flea markets after that. Wow. Oh. Oh my gosh, it really is a fascinating turn. So you're in this whole video production game. What brought on the thrifting of it all and the flea markets and the reselling? 
Well, like I said, it was it was always something that we were doing just on the side as a passion and uh, an enjoyment. Um, but we we saw the uh, potential of YouTube and producing the content um, years and years ago. Uh, we were at a garage sale in Santa Barbara and I bought one of these crazy, crazy unique items. It was a teddy bear of Ted Kennedy. It was from the 1980 <laughs> presidential election and, and just Google Ted Kennedy teddy bear. It is terrifying. It's like it's something that will like creep into your bed at night and stare at you and you will you will be scared to death of it. But it was so unique and so funny mm -hmm. that I thought. I should like, you know, we should like talk about the history of this. We should do like a little documentary and put it up on YouTube. And at that time, monetization wasn't like a big thing. So we decided not to do it. We had a lot of shows in production and it just was, you know, it was going to be extra time that we didn't have. Mm -hmm. But um, as time went on uh, during the pandemic, we started watching a lot of YouTube channels and seeing that people were um, thrifting and reselling and, you know, antique hunting and they were documenting it. So uh, we uh, jumped into it. We just we kind of took the dive in uh, February of this year. Wow. And uh, in the nine months since, it's just been absolutely fantastic. We are just under 5000 subscribers. And I am so, so grateful to everybody who who subscribes and watches because it's really because of them that we've had the success that we've had this year. What's it like working with your parents? Oh, it's the best. I mean. <laughs> Um, so I, I've been really fortunate in my life. I've done a lot of like lessons with um, kids where I go in and I talk to them about filmmaking and television production. And I always say to them, you know, the absolute best thing that you can have is people you can trust mm -hmm. on your side. Mm -hmm. And there's no people that I trust more than, than my parents. My, my mother, Harleen is a fantastic producer. My father, Gary is the best cinematographer and sound engineer I could ask for. So having them right there at my side, I know that we're going to be able to get the job done. And, and we've been doing this for so long. We've been doing television production for over a decade. We're kind of at the point where the three of us can do the jobs of like, 10 other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it really is a family affair. So now you get to travel around, document. I love that you guys are total foodies too. Oh yeah. Talk about that. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, always it's always food's always been a wonderful thing. We actually did a a restaurant review TV show for a while in Santa Barbara. Ooh. So you got to explore all the restaurants and try their different foods and go back into the kitchens with the chefs. That was so much fun. Um, so we thought that that would be a really interesting aspect to incorporate. Uh, we moved to Las Vegas uh, about five months before we launched the channel. And Las Vegas is one of the culinary capitals of the world. You could go to a different restaurant every single day for years years and never repeat. So uh, we thought that that would be a really fun aspect to add into the channel. And um, and and we discover new things all the time. I've got a uh, an ongoing list on my phone and we're just chatting with somebody that we meet around town and they say, oh, have you been here yet? And we gotta say, go. absolutely not yeah. on the list. <laughs> That's incredible. Okay. So let it, let's back up a little bit too. So you were originally from, you know, central-ish California then. You guys were in Santa Barbara and then you moved to Las Vegas. What sparked the move? Uh, my brother moved here about five years ago and um, we're a very close family. And um, we we thought that, um, you know, it was the right time uh, after the pandemic to uh, to start something new. We're still in Santa Barbara all the time. I mean, I was there Six days ago, we were in Santa Barbara mm -hmm. filming, uh, and we'll be there in a couple of weeks. It's uh, so close. I mean, a five-hour drive. Um, yeah. So it's it's really easy to just go back and forth, and uh, it just felt like the right time to start something new. Okay. And let's go back again. The Santa Barbara Film Festival. You you did some. I, I watched some of the video on this. I loved your it, personal Instagram content on this. Talk about that. You met some really amazing people. What were you guys doing at the film festival? Well, we we still do it actually. So we'll be there in February. Um, we are the official house crew. So we do the official red carpet interviews. Um, when a celebrity comes for a, an event, Santa Barbara is one of the last film festivals before they vote for the Oscars. So it's kind of that crunch time for celebrities to campaign for their. Oh, how Award. interesting. Who knew? 
Yeah. So, um, so when we uh, announce our honorees, you can usually guess that those are the people who are going to go in hard to try and win the Academy Award. So it's their opportunity to meet a lot of voters because a lot of retired Hollywood people are there. So we conduct the interviews with them. I uh, work with Harleen, my mom, to write the questions. She conducts the interview, Gary films it all, and then they feed the footage to me. And I send that off to hundreds and hundreds of uh, markets. So if you're watching Good Morning America and they say, last night in Santa Barbara, Brad Pitt had this to say, mm -hmm. then you see that clip that 99% of the time is one of our clips that you're seeing. That's and incredible. we're very excited because we just found out that uh, we've got Robert Downey Jr. coming in a few months. That's incredible. I mean, is this what you always thought you wanted to do? Be a film person, a person in film in this capacity? Or is it just kind of evolved? Absolutely. I've, I've always been tied to film. I've, I've loved film since I was a kid. Um, I've talked many times in interviews uh, promoting our documentary that um, when I was six years old and Jurassic Park came out and I saw it in the theaters, I saw this movie and I thought, oh, oh my God, anything is possible. And uh, from that point on, I knew I wanted to be a filmmaker. And um, I started watching classic films when I was in middle school, I think elementary school. I was convincing, you know, the, the we would have movie days and I would convince them to watch like Yankee Doodle Dandy and instead of Space Jam. <laughs> a solid choice there, by the way. Right. Um, and that the Jurassic Park mention really does tie back to the first thing you ever sold on eBay at the age of 12. Talk about that. I definitely want to get your take on eBay. Yeah. Um, so eBay, this amazing thing came along back in the days where you had to mail mail orders or checks off to people and, and it took weeks and weeks and you had to do the photos and everything. The first thing I ever sold on eBay was a VHS copy of Jurassic Park. Wow. Yeah. That is just amazing. All right. Let's talk about eBay. Um, so since you've been selling since 12, was it the same account or do you have a new one now? I had, um, yeah, my, the account that I'm currently on, I've had since 2004. So I'm coming up on 20 years with it. Oh my God, that's um, incredible. The Harleen's account is 25 years old. Yeah. Wow. So incredible. Um, it's been, it's been an interesting journey seeing eBay progress over the years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, the reseller community, you know, obviously you're entrenched in this. You have a lot of friends in this community. What's your take on it? Is it, is it just a great, you know, warm community? Is there pitfalls? Talk a little bit about how you feel about the eBay community or reseller community in general. I, I think it's a fantastic community. I mean, the chance that we had to meet you at Boss, I mean, that's that's a highlight of it right there to get that many people together and just have a wonderful time for a week in Vegas. Mm -hmm. um, it shows you how how close it is. And, you know, you're, you're just standing around and talking about this find and that find and what's the, you know, what's the cool place in your town to go to? We'll be there at some point, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah. everybody's very, very welcoming. That's the greatest part about it. Um, we went last year, um, kind of in preparation of where we were going with this. Uh, mm -hmm. we were, we were going to be moving into a booth, uh, a boutique booth, uh, with some of our merchandise here in Vegas. And, uh, we were kind of ramping that hole up. We, we knew we were going to start a channel eventually. We didn't know it was going to launch in February. We, again, we kind of jumped all in on that, which was great. Um, but, uh, getting to meet people completely, cold called, you know, like we just walked right up and said, hi, how are you? And then a year later, you're reconnecting with them. And it's like, no time passed at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does just feel like this uh, family. It's pretty incredible. And I know people are really starting to talk about the family affair that is the three of you together doing this adventure, which I absolutely love that you're getting some buzz around that. Talk well, about we, the... love, we, we love that each of us have our different things too. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm yeah. pop culture, Harleen is antiques, Gary's obsessed with glowy glass, all that kind of stuff. I love that glowy glass video. Um, talk about the booth. Tell us where it is. Give us all the deets so we can come find it in Vegas. Oh, yeah. It's at the Good Stuff in Las Vegas on Decatur. And um, that's that's so much fun. We filmed a lot of videos in there. And um, there's a lot of new stuff coming in 2024, too. So you're going to have to keep an eye on the channel. We're going to have some big announcements coming soon. And that'll be, that'll be really exciting. I love it. If you're in Vegas, guys, please check out this booth. Give them some love. Um, let's talk a little bit more about your travel plus... Uh, treasure hunting. You've been to Rome, you've been to London, you've been to Paris, and I have to know about this rural Swiss cow festival. So tell us all the places. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so this last trip in April, uh, we spent nine days in Switzerland and, uh, we did get, uh, we did get some, uh, some picking in there. Um, it was uh, that was a little more hectic because we were filming the show on that side. But um, Gary and Harleen were able to film some great content in the town of Zermatt. Uh, and Zermatt is the base town of the Matterhorn. Ugh. So you are literally picking underneath the Matterhorn. And while they were doing that, I was up uh, in a helicopter over the Matterhorn with an avalanche rescue dog. And they were throwing me out of the helicopter into the snow. And that was just a crazy fun experience. Um, but then uh, as soon as we finished uh, our shoot in Switzerland, we went over to Paris and the Paris flea markets are heaven on earth. I tell wow. you. Wow. Oh my gosh. I love this. It was so great. There's a different one every single day. There's a huge one up in Montmartre, right behind like the Moulin Rouge and the Sacre Coeur. So um, that one is like 10 city blocks in size. It was just Incredible. tremendous. But we found a little tiny one kind of kind of off the beaten path. And that one was so impressive. We actually went back to it a second time. Um, but it was just, it was so much fun. We found these incredible items. One of my, one of my goals on that trip was to come home with a vintage camera that I could restore and actually use. Yeah. And I bought a uh, 1934 Kodak camera with Bakelite accents. Wow. It's super clean. So I don't have a lot of restoration to do on it. I'm just waiting for the opportunity to get the film cartridges and I'm going to go around Vegas and I'm going to take photos of modern Vegas with a 1934 camera. Oh, that's incredible. And I'm sure you'll document the whole thing because your content is just really engaging. People love watching. I love to see the comments that you're getting on all these videos. How does that feel? That is so special to us. Uh, when we see that people are actually, you know, understanding, engaging, responding, they're teaching us things. We absolutely love learning things. You know, it's all about that next fact that you never knew. And then because you see things, you see repeats of things. And if somebody teaches you something or you teach them, then the second time they see it, then they suddenly know, oh, that's something interesting. That's something of value or mm -hmm. maybe not to go out go for that. Um, the comments that we get are just an absolute treasure. And we appreciate every single one of our viewers who takes that time. And some people really take their time. They, oh, they, they go it. through it and they give us details. And, and, you know, how special is that, that somebody cares enough to take the time and talk about what they're watching? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love that you kind of talk about, you know, thrifting, broadening your worldview. It's like school, you're finding an item, you're doing the research, you're learning the history. And speaking of her history, I have to know, please tell us the background. What is the Rural Swiss Cow Festival? What is it? So um, this is <laughs> done. Um, it's been done back to Roman times, apparently. Wow. In its current iteration, I think it's about 120 years old. But um, the 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 cows, the female cows are extremely aggressive, but not in a violent way. Um, they, they fight to be like the head of the herd, but they never draw blood. So what they do is they have this big arena and the, the cows like go in and they put their, their heads against each other with their horns and they like push and whoever gets pushed out loses. And then the next one comes in and it's almost like a sumo wrestling match that you're watching. Wow. And at the end of this like four day affair, the queen of the cows is crowned and, and, and the cows respect her. It's like, it's this incredible thing. It's and, and so I guess wild. she's the, the queen of the cows for the summer. Uh, of course, her value goes way up. So the farmers get to say, I've got the queen of the cows. Um, her calves are more expensive, all that kind of stuff. It's almost like having a thoroughbred racehorse win the race. Oh my gosh. This is just the most fascinating thing I've ever heard. I mean... And it's a big deal in Switzerland too. They had it on live television. They had big cameras everywhere, but it's like, it's a local thing. And they told us, we were talking to the uh, the head of publicity for it, who was also the kind of the... Uh, uh, de facto mayor of the town, he was saying, we've never had an American crew document this before. So when we premiered that episode, which you can watch online, uh, animalzone.org, um, that, that when that episode premiered, it was the first time that American audiences really got a look into this tradition that goes back 2000 years. It really is fascinating. So going into Switzerland, did you know you were going to be filming this particular? Oh, absolutely. This okay. was one of our highlights we were wow. really looking forward to it and we were nervous because the day before they were predicting very heavy rain and it rained that morning 
and it rained that night. But in the time we were there, it was like the clouds were open. It was just amazing. Wow. Incredible. And they had a bit of a, they had a bit of a market there. Um, they were selling uh, antique um, uh, cowbells and they were selling uh, farming ephemera and everything. So that was kind of fun to look at. Uh, obviously high, high retail prices. So nothing we could take home. Uh, those cowbells are thousands of dollars. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, what's the vibe in Europe for for thrifting? We ask everyone who, you know, goes international and, and you know, does the treasure hunt, their thoughts on it. What do you think's going on in Europe? Is it the same here? What are your feelings? Give us a little insight. Well, I think the uh, the flea markets were alive and well. They were packed. I mean, it was full. It was, you know, there were certain points where it was wall to wall people trying to get through uh, the really good areas. Uh, they had them separated by uh, by themes. So you had kind of like fashion in one section and mm -hmm. super high end antiques in another section. Then you have kind of like the the junk hunt section. Um, so there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of different areas, and you get into like the area where you're really kind of picking through. A uh, mishmash of stuff that was crowded. It was very crowded, and I was um, pleasantly surprised to see that they were actually offended if you didn't negotiate because I like wow. the negotiation. <laughs> I think it's fun, you know. I, I think if they, if you, um, if they say that's going to be five euros and you hand them five euros, they're going to be like Americans. <laughs> that's hilarious. Well, what do you think changed? I mean, you grew up in this thrifting, bargaining, haggling kind of world your whole life, obviously, is generational. But do you think that the younger gen is kind of discovering the value of of buying secondhand? What do you, what do you think changed? I think so. I think I think if you have an appreciation for for various topics, you know, if you're interested in pop culture or you're interested in history, then it's a great way for you to discover things. Um, in one of our recent videos, my best friend Tyler, who's from Missouri, came out to Vegas and we went to one of the largest antique malls in Las Vegas together and we filmed a whole video there. And, you know, it, I, I thought it was really refreshing to see somebody else my age who was appreciating the history. And, and we were going back and forth and having fun and laughing and making jokes about yeah we found a we found a board game of watergate that was made a couple of years oh ago God. so i mean if you're if you appreciate history that's the kind of crazy fun stuff you can find out there mm -hmm. um as far as the way that it's evolved over the years i think obviously ebay changed the game in a huge way mm -hmm. um now you know you you find a uh, gone with the wind plates for a dollar 50 when they yeah. used to be a thousand dollars at auction yeah uh, but um I think it's also made things um, more special, you know, because now you now you can learn that an addition of 50,000 is a lot. 50,000 yeah. is a lot of items. But if something is on an addition of 100, then it's going to be a lot harder to find that. That's much more special. And you guys are pretty active on whatnot, too, correct? Absolutely. It's a, such a great platform. I love that you've been able to combine, um, you know, the selling of eBay and the interaction of live television, QVC, any of those kind of things, uh, because that's that's something that I did think was lacking for a long time was that direct interaction with people. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I I miss, you know, going to live auctions back uh, before the pandemic. There used to be, you know, live auctions where you go there with an actual bid paddle and have fun and find mm -hmm. treasures and buy lots and everything. And I missed that so much. Yeah. And it's definitely your personality is what sells some things. You know what I mean? To me, that's like a really special part of what you've been able to capture with your YouTube videos videos is taking advantage of your endearing personality that people want to hear from you. Is that something you were born with, William, or is that something you've kind of honed over the years? I mean, I've, I've always been, I'm, I'm excited and I'm a storyteller and I love sharing. We all do, you know, we all love sharing our stories. They're the, the stories that we have are what made us who we are. And so, you know, all three of us, Gary, Harleen, and I, when, when we see something that evokes a memory and we can tell a story about that, then our hope is that we're either teaching somebody something they didn't know yeah. or evoking a memory in them. Ugh. And then, uh, you know, one of the, one of the great comments that I see is when, excuse me, when I see an item that. I, I profile on the channel or Harleen picks it up and talks about it for a second, or Gary sees a piece of glowy glass and talks about it. And then somebody writes in the comments, 
I had that piece. Yeah. My mom had that piece. Oh. I remember holding that piece when I was a kid. That kind of stuff is so special because then it, it's purposeful. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it really brings something to people that, that they, it brings back a memory that they maybe didn't have until that moment. Yeah. And like you always continue to say, it's like preserving this, these pieces of history. I have to know about the NASA documents that you found in a shoebox. Tell us more. Oh, wow. So this was, this was one of our best estate sales ever, uh, uh, in that, um, Harleen got an absolutely incredible piece of art, uh, by Curtis Jarre, which was a famous design studio in New York in the mid-century era. Um, she she got this for, I believe, $150. It's worth like $5,000. Incredible. Absolutely amazing piece. We kept it. It's uh, it's it's a treasure. Yeah. Uh, but then, uh, so, so this, this family, this was a, a family of artists. And I guess the, um, the, the grandson of the three generations of artists was also a scientist and uh, he worked for NASA and he designed, wow. uh, he designed some of the sensors that were used on the space probes that were sent to Mars, Venus, and Jupiter. Wow. And um, I had no idea of any of this at the time, but uh, we're going through this sale. And this was like the Sunday afternoon after a three-day sale. The place was kind of picked over, but that that incredible piece was there. And we got that. And we're thinking, wow, this is amazing. And I see a shoebox on the floor under a table. And I see that there's like a piece of paper sticking out of the side of it. So I just open it up and I peek in and I notice that I see that it's just piles and piles of paper in there and they're all stamped NASA. Okay. Incredible. Uh, excuse me, <laughs> sir. How much would you like for this shoe box of paper? Oh my God. Oh, uh, give me $5. No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Throw the $5 bill at him and then you run know. out. <laughs> yeah, no, but um, it was really, it was incredible. Uh, it was original NASA documents about the space probe series wow. that um, that explored the solar system in the uh, in the later years of the space race. I mean, this was Mariner and um, uh, it's, it was, uh, I'm trying to remember the names of all of them. It was Mariner space probe and Viking space probe. Wow. Absolutely incredible stuff. And I, um, I sold them to private collectors and to museums, and it was just really, it was amazing uh, to also let those things that had been in a shoebox get out there into the world and let people appreciate yeah, them. Yeah, priceless pieces of history. So you use several tools to make sure that you're authenticating things and to understand the history. Can you, you know, share with our listeners some of those tools that you use, like um, Google Lens, eBay History, all, all the search platforms that you kind of utilize to make sure that you're finding all the detail that you need to about these items? Absolutely. Um, I mean, the having a smartphone is such a game changer. You were saying earlier, how does how has things changed over the years? That's another big thing is having that smartphone in your hand and having all those incredible apps that you can do things with. Uh, Google Lens is a relatively recent one for me. I only started using it since we started doing the channel, but it is so incredibly useful mm -hmm. um, within its limits. Obviously, there are some things that can flummox the AI, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, no, I absolutely love having that at my hands. eBay history is fantastic. Um, I actually, I, I also use a site called Heritage Auctions, um, uh, HA. Uh, if you register an account with them, which is free to do, you can look up their entire auction history. And wow. that's great for me as a pop culture guy. Like if I see a movie poster, I can track the last 25 years worth of sales of that movie poster and see, okay, so that movie was doing really well 10 years ago, but now it's maybe only a $20 poster or something. So um, you just bookmark, bookmark, bookmark. If you find a site that's a great resource for a piece of history, put it in your bookmarks folder. And then you're, you know, I've got a site for glowy glass and we're out and Gary sees a piece of glowy glass. And I say, all right, let's figure out what that uh, maker's mark is on there. Yeah. And you mentioned AI. So is AI just like making this whole process of research even easier and learning as it goes? 
You know, it's interesting because I, I the only way in which I've really interacted with it so far is uh, Google Lens, and then um, I've I've done some experimenting with eBay and the AI autofill in their descriptions, and it was funny because. Uh, you know, it's getting there. It, it it makes some humorous comments occasionally that you sure. have to do some editing of. Yeah. But uh, yeah, like I think I listed something involving Taylor Swift and it said, Taylor Swift is a very nice lady. And I thought, hmm, <laughs> okay, well, I'm sure that's right, but that's not going to help me sell this item. <laughs> True statement, but give me some more factual info. How interesting. It really is fascinating to see how things change. And I'm, I'm curious because you do a good job of authenticating autographs. You've kind of learned as you've gone. And I'm wondering how these platforms are going to help you to do that in the future. How do you currently do it? Well, I mean, there's several things that you can do, especially with like an autograph. Um, it's great to have a loop because if you can get in really close to that ink, you can see, first of all, is it a live signature? Interesting. Um, if you have if you have a, a, a photo signed with a Sharpie and they loop the ink around, you can see whether or not there's two layers of ink over an intersection versus an auto pen or a print where it's just a straight line. Uh, for This a is so fascinating. <laughs> for for a much older autograph, for historical autographs, um, there's a, an interesting trick that um, the autographs actually will have rust in them. Um, they used iron ink uh, in the 19th century and before, wow. so it would have been black when they signed it, but now it would have a rust tone to it because the iron has rusted on it. We were at a um, an antique store in, I want to say, either Montana or South Dakota a few years back. And they had some 19th century presidential autographs. And obviously I just saw it on the, uh, on the wall and I went, I beelined for it. And as I, the closer and closer I got, I looked at it and I said, those were signed with modern pens. You can see that there's no rust to the signatures. Wow. Even in the most well-preserved setting, there would be rust in that signature. Uh, you could see that it was signed with a more recent felt tip pen. And I, told the gentleman behind the counter, you might want to have somebody look at those. I don't think they're authentic. How interesting. And I love one of the things you do in your videos is you talk about what you paid for something and what you believe that it's worth. Mm -hmm. How do you determine, and it's things like this, not seeing the rust in the ink that tells you if it's worth the price, right? Absolutely. Well, that's that's for authentics. For value, I mean, it is so easy to to compare values nowadays when you've got eBay sold and worth point and all these different sites that can give you um, historical values. And and it's interesting to see how values have changed over time. That um, that very scary Ted Kennedy bear I told you about, uh, we sold it for five hundred dollars, and now you can get one for like eighty dollars. I guess they wow. found more of them out there. Interesting. Yeah. And kind of bringing these things that are, were in the wild to eBay does probably up their value just by them being available for sale. Interesting. Yeah. Finding them for less later on. This is so fascinating. I knew I was going to have a million questions, William, but we're all over the place. So sorry about that, but I'm like loving this. So I have a note in my show notes. I definitely want to make sure I'm asking you about that. You really are devoted to finding the right homes for items. So you don't necessarily sell everything. If you know this is something that deserves to be in a museum, you find the right home for it, correct? Absolutely. Um, Talk about so, that. Uh, about five years ago, in Santa Barbara, we weren't even supposed to be out picking. I think we were super early for a shoot and we said, okay, well, it's a Saturday morning and there's some garage sales nearby. Let's go check it out. Um, this, uh, this lady was selling um, very, very modern new stuff, like absolutely nothing that would be flippable or it was just like all just new recent products. And then she had a box and I opened the box. And there's it was always a box. There's always a box, right? <laughs> Uh, one of these days I'm going to find Pandora and that's going to be the bad one. But, you know, uh, so I open the box and it's full of World War II patches. And I'm like, OK, this is very different than everything else you have. And she's, oh, yeah, that was my father's. And he was a World War II pilot uh, navigator. And um, and I said, oh, wow, do you have anything else? And she said, oh, yeah, I've got I've got maps and I've got his uniform and I've got all this stuff. I said, do you want to sell it? And and she said, yeah, no, I, I'd sell it. So she takes us into her house. And I ended up buying the uniform, a box full of 
maps that were actual maps that he took up on the planes. He was one of the Jolly Rogers who were some of the most prolific fighters of the Pacific War. Uh, I mean, these guys fought in the Battle of the Coral Sea and Midway and everything. Incredible, incredible history. So, um, so I ended up buying this incredible large lot from her. And um, there were, I believe, a dozen maps that were actually flown maps that had crayon markings on them from from when he was up there like navigating and writing here's the enemy positions here's where we are this is where we need to be that kind of crazy stuff on it so uh between those 12 i i sold them to the smithsonian the national world war ii museum who also bought the uniform and a chinese museum uh, dedicated to World War II history wow. um, because one of the maps actually had the proposed landing spots that planes could could um, make emergency landings in in China if they had to bail out. You're blowing my mind. Absolutely blowing my mind. To take the time to do that research and not just, you know, sell it on eBay is pretty mm-hmm. special. And what a great lesson. Are you open? Because I feel like you'd be a great resource to, you know, possibly listeners who find this kind of stuff at strange flea markets or, you know, homes here in Denver. Are you open to people reaching out and asking you questions? I mean, you really are quite the historian. A million percent. Yes. What we always say is please subscribe to our channel, leave a comment in there. We always post our email address um, in every single video. So if you want to send us a message, just leave us a uh, leave us a comment on there. And we're always happy to to engage and interact. And maybe you're going to teach us something, too, which is a really great thing for yeah, us, which is pretty fantastic. It definitely is a win win networking community. All right. Tell us about Teddy Ruxpin, because I, too, have a personal love of that crazy, very creepy doll. <laughs> oh, I, I had I had one of the original Teddy Ruxpins, the ones that worked on the cassette tapes. Now they work mm-hmm. on, you know, like they've got the digital eyes, which are even. Wait a minute. Here. They still have Teddy Ruxpin out there. Oh, my Lord. I just saw one a couple of weeks ago at a sale. Now they have LED eyes that open Ugh. and close. Uh, but I loved mine when I was a kid. I, yeah. I loved mine that worked on With a cassette With the cassette tape, tape. yes. Yep. In, it, so <laughs> in 2012, I want to say it was, whenever uh, it was the year that Superstorm Sandy hit the East Coast and really wiped out a lot of those beach communities in New Jersey and New York and everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um I had just purchased a, um, this was, and that was in like early December, I think we're coming up on the anniversary of that. Um, I had just purchased a brand new in the box, Teddy Ruxpin, uh, mint condition, absolutely fantastic. And I saw it and it brought back a memory of my childhood. So I, so I went ahead and bought it at the sale. Um, so that, that storm had hit and I put it up on eBay and I got a message from somebody and they said, um, uh, can we can we arrange overnight shipping on this? We lost everything in the storm, oh. and I want to get this for my kids so that, to replace the one that they lost. Wow! And I had tears in my eyes as I packaged that up, knowing that I was going to be fulfilling those kids' Christmas and getting that back to them. It was just such a special moment. Oh my gosh, that really does speak to how special this community is, and that if you're open, you know, you really do get to preserve a piece of history oh for that family that's amazing oh and to bring to bring back something that they lost too i mean for i don't know how old the kids were if they had if they were looking for teddy ruxpin i assume they're pretty small but you know if you're in that position where you don't understand why something that you love is gone and then suddenly it's back to you that that probably is a very special moment for them Mm -hmm. absolutely All right, let's talk about your unicorn item. Can you tell us the coolest thing you've ever found? And I can't imagine how you would narrow it down, but give it a shot. I would say for me personally, um, I have a collection of movie posters um, that I bought here in Las Vegas. Uh, We went went into the sale and um, I saw a stacked pile of movie poster tubes in the corner. And I said, oh, are those movie posters? And he said, oh yeah. Those were Steven Spielberg's mom's posters. What? William, your life. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Tell me more. <laughs> so this this gentleman was um, Steven Spielberg's mom, Eileen. He was her personal assistant. Wow. And um, whenever a film would come out, Steven would send his mom some posters and she would put them up in the restaurant that she owned. 
Uh, it was called the Milky Way in Beverly Hills. And she would put the posters up and then um, and then she would give these posters to him, uh, the, to her assistant. And he had this collection of posters and I bought them all at an insanely low price. Uh, and I, I, I didn't even look in what was in half of them. I, I opened one. I saw Indiana Jones. I said, I'll take them all. Yeah. Um, they all, every single tube has the sticker that says from Amblin Entertainment to Eileen Adler, the Milky Way with the address in Beverly Hills. And um, sure enough, there's an original one sheet to Jurassic Park in there. You're kidding. So I went full circle. Full circle full, moment. First, full circle to the moment I wanted decided to become a filmmaker. And that is my poster. And that will be my poster for the rest of my life. I mean, William, Lisa told me this was going to be a great interview, but this is blowing my mind. <laughs> I mean, this is some incredible stuff. I love this is my next question then. Are you going to do a movie about this adventure that you've had with your family or write a book or something? Because I just want to keep hearing more of your stories. I have certainly thought about it. We've all talked about it. Um, we save all the footage that we have from all of this. So Good. it's not out of the question. Um, right now, we're just having such a blast putting out all this content. We do three episodes a week on the channel. Mm -hmm. um, so if we do decide to turn it into it, we've got all of this great material that we uh, we could use in the future. But right now, we're just uh, we're having great fun putting out these videos and, and interacting with people. I mean, I've got to do a shameless, not so shameless plug to come out to Denver. I mean, you guys have got to come check out our stores. We'd love for you to come see all of Denver. And there's just so much great thrifting and picking here. You won't be disappointed. You know, as soon as your talk at the uh, reseller remix ended, we were huddling up and we were talking about this. We Yay. are so in for it. We are so excited. You know, one of our uh, the fourth member of the Picker Road family is the Beast, our, mm. our uh, Ford F-150 truck. Yay, we love a big car. perfect for taking road trips and you can just fill it full of amazing treasures. So we are going to definitely, definitely be looking at dates in the spring to come out and, wow. and see all of ARC. I mean, I loved your presentation. I love what you guys are doing there. And I am so excited to go exploring. Oh. Thank you so much. I'm really, really excited. I, I cannot wait to have the three of you here and really give us your feedback on, on what you think. You know, we want, we want to see you like in our stores, checking it out, giving me some good feedback. Hopefully there's a story there. You know, um, I feel like these stories seem to come to you, William. It's just your personality. Well, it's, it's fun to be enthusiastic about things too, because, you know, history deserves enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's so many people that that think that history is, you know, a stuffy room with somebody telling a story very slowly and everything. <laughs> but it's that's not the case. I mean, things are exciting. The, the, the history of an item is exciting. And and you imagine what it's been through. Uh, we did a segment on one of our shows where we were talking about items uh, from ancient Egypt. Oh, and I was holding a piece of fabric in my hand that was 4,000 years old. Wow. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking that this went through the Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Titanic, the, you know, the every piece of history, the moon landing that has happened since this was made. I mean, the incredible history of an item mm -hmm. and, and how it transcends time. And you're like a time traveler when you get to hold it in your hand. Oh. Time traveler. I love it when you guys name your own episode because literally that's what this feels like. This entire episode feels like a time travel. I love the history. What do you want to put that out into the universe? What do you want to find next? What could possibly be out there in your mind that you want to manifest? I, you know, I'm always looking for movie stuff. My, my hope one of these days is to find a working 35 millimeter camera that is not a you know a million dollars. <laughs> I have I have found eight millimeter, 16 millimeter. I need a 35 millimeter camera. Wow. So All that's right. one of my goals one of these days. All right. We'll put it out there for you. Who knows? Maybe it happens in Denver. I'm gonna cross my fingers. Um I gotta ask the 2024 goal for you, Harleen and Gary, what's next? so much more traveling fun 
like I was saying, we are so excited to be going out to Denver and seeing you and, and exploring ARC. We're going to, we're, we're looking that we're going to probably do a week worth of picking out there and just go through as many stores as we can Yay. and, um, and, and going all over the place. Well, we're going up to Seattle in, uh, right in January. Mm -hmm. Um, we're going to be, uh, in San Francisco a few days after that. Um, there's a very likely possibility that we'll be in Japan next oh, year. Incredible. And, and, um, of course, one of your previous guests, Laura Caldwell, she's going out there too. I think she's going to be there. If, if our plans sync up, she's there like a week before we are. Incredible. Um, I've heard that there's amazing picking there. So, um, who knew sky <sighs> is the limit, you know, we, picking in space. <laughs> <laughs> Keep us posted. I want to watch that video. Well, William, we always say that this podcast is devoted to spreading the good word of shopping secondhand, but it really is people like you that are making it happen. So bravo. And thank you for your service. We're so grateful for you. And thank you so much for what you're doing. I mean, with the podcast, the store, everything, the stores, all the mm -hmm. stores, I mean, it's just amazing to have places to go and and find amazing Dolly Parton stuff whenever mm -hmm. you want. Absolutely. And as always, we like to give a shout out to our girl. At the end of every single Get Thrifty podcast, we do a shout out to one Miss Dolly Parton. My understanding is that you have an incredible story. So give it to me, William. What would you like to say or tell me about your our girl, one Miss Dolly Parton? So we all love Dolly, of course. And um, about... I want to say four years ago, five years ago, um, for Mother's Day, uh, Gary and I surprised Harleen with tickets to see Dolly at the Hollywood Bowl. Oh, my God. And that was one of the best concerts we've ever been to. I mean, she's she is such a powerhouse. She did not stop for that entire show. And she was amazing. Oh, I just love this. First of all, that you're such a good son. But the Hollywood Bowl, iconic place to see Dolly Parton play 50 million different instruments. And just wow, was it just incredible? It was something else. It really <laughs> was. I, I mean, and and the crowd too. You can tell when, you know, a crowd is just kind of there and mm -hmm. then you can tell when they're in it. Oh. oh, they were in it. And that was and that and that accentuates the the greatness of a concert mm -hmm. so well. The whole experience. A friend of mine has a picture of me when I got to see Dolly here at Red Rocks, which if you come to Colorado, you have to go to Red Rocks. You've got to see you know, it. I bought I bought a series of posters from Red Rock concerts once. I've to wanted to go it. there ever since. Yes, and they have a great museum downstairs, so you have to come check it out when it's closed. If you can see a show while you're here in the spring, it's just a whole other experience. And to see Dolly there was like, like you said, a, a highlight when the crowd is in it. It's just a whole different experience, right? That's Amazing. So <laughs> William, you are an absolute delight. Tell our listeners once again how they can find you all the places on social. You are open to questions and love from our listeners, which we always love. So please share all the ways. Absolutely. We are at Picker Road on YouTube and whatnot. We will be launching our Instagram channel in 2024. We will have that handle. We, you know, whenever we post a video on YouTube, that's three times a week. You go into our description and it's got the links to both of our eBay stores. It's got a referral link on whatnot. If you join through our referral link, you get a uh, a credit from whatnot towards your first purchase. And uh, we will be launching all sorts of new stuff in the coming year. So always keep an eye out. Always uh, stay informed because there's there's a lot of exciting stuff coming. Perfection, William. Thanks so much. And listeners, thanks so much for joining us once again for the Get Thrifty podcast. Reminder, please save our pod and leave us a five-star review about how fun and creative and smart we are. And if you're part of our unique thrift culture and you'd like to be on this podcast, we'd love to have you. Reach out via Instagram at Podcast with Maggie. Follow us on Instagram at Arc Thrift and now on TikTok at Arc Thrift Stores. Thanks so much and have a wonderful week. It's the Get Thrifty Podcast. This podcast was powered by Arc Thrift Stores and edited by Avocet Communications.